Namaste and a global uh, welcome to all our viewers from around the world. Welcome to yet another broadcast. This is Nishit Kotak with the team from Hindu Academy. Uh, if you are new to the broadcast, welcome to the broadcast. And let me just give you a quick rundown on what we do and how the broadcast is structured. So we meet every Saturday at two o'clock UK time, and we run for about 50 to 55 minutes. We do start with a focus topic. Uh, the topics are always around, the, uh, um, uh, around Hinduism. But to get us started, we have a focus topic video. We'll watch the video, have a discussion around that topic, and then open it up for general Q&A on anything to do with Hinduism. Now, how can you, the viewer, get involved? A, you can follow us on our social media channels on Facebook or YouTube. We are at Hindu Academy. Uh, and you can then share this broadcast with your friends and family. The more people that can join us, the better the conversation we can have with them. And everybody has a great time on the broadcast. Number two, you can then subscribe to our channel on YouTube where we have over three and a half thousand videos and we post new content every week on a regular basis. So let me just send, uh, share with you all the focus topic of the video. Uh, sorry, focus topic of the week today is to do with Murti Puja, or um, we're looking at the concept of um, worshipping a deity or an image or, or an icon uh, and how it is related to in Hinduism. So let's watch this little video and we will be back to discuss this very interesting topic of the day. Does God really re reside in a de deity? Yes, you see, look, this is, look, how do, how do I know? My mentor Ramakrishna was able to see that image of Mother Goddess, you know, Kali, turn into real reality. So whenever he went into the temple, when he looked at the image, there was no stone image, there was a real Goddess looking at him, looking back at him. This is reality. And I believe it hands up. Eh? And this is not really me. We were kind of couldn't believe that. So he used to make fun of Ramakrishna saying, oh, this mother goddess and you sing, you know, do this, you know, this, you know, this thing, making chapatis all the time. This is the best of time. He liked philosophy, Atman and Brahman, not these all these goddesses and all that. He would make fun of Ramakrishna all the time. And one day when he was under serious duress, you know, because he was struggling with money issues, though he was starving. So he finally went to Ramakrishna and said, look, you believe in mother goddess. Ramakrishna said, yes, yes, yes. Can you please ask her to help me financially? You know, poor Narendra was kind of under serious duress. Eh? His, his family was starving. And his father had passed away. And Ramakrishna said, why should I ask? You go and ask. He said, no demand, <laughs> I told you. He said, you go and ask. He come in the, to the temple in the evening and the mother goddess will be waiting for you inside the temple. Go and ask her. This is a true story. So then Vivekanan, when the evening went, he was feeling very shy because he didn't want to kind of ask for anything and he felt very low that he has to go and literally beg for money from the mother goddess. He felt very poor about himself. But with shaky feet, he went into the temple. He was just asked to go by himself. This is a true story. That's why I'm touched by it. And I can see exactly what happened to poor Vivekananda. He said, as I came closer to the image, as I climbed up the steps, suddenly my hair on my body started to stand up. And I felt I'm in presence of some great, great power. And I was looking at the steps. And then when my eyes, just imagine if it happens to you, eh? what will happen to you? When my eyes gazed upward to look at the image of Mother Goddess, Instead of seeing that kind of image made of stone, I saw the mother goddess staring back at me. Can you believe what will happen to you if that happens to you? <laughs> this happened to poor Vivekananda. He didn't want to be mother goddess. And there she was smiling at him. And do you know what that happened? Vivekananda had gone to say, please help me financially. And she would have given him. Instead of doing that, Vivekananda folded. See, this is the power of true devotee, true spiritual aspirant. He folded his mother. Don't give, give me nothing but love at thy, thy feet. Make sure I never forget your mother. Give me devotion at your feet, mother. He kept repeating that. Forget about money. And then after doing all this repetition, mother got a smile. You're okay, you'll have devotion at my feet. And he went out. He went to Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna, did you ask for money? He said, I forgot. Ah. <laughs> it was like going to the king and asking for marbles. You know, when you go to king, you ask for diamond, don't ask for marbles. He said he was feeling like asking like marbles, you know, to, from, a, from the king. I can't do that. Ramakrishna, don't worry, you are in trouble, aren't you? Go back, go back. She's still waiting for you. 
three times the poor man went in. All the three times, more and more devoutly said, Mother, give me nothing but devotion at your feet. And he came out. And finally he came out, he was still struggling. And Ramakrishna was smiling. He knew exactly what had happened in the temple because he knew this man can never ask for such menial things. So he said, it's all your fault. He told Ramakrishna, it's all your fault. You don't, you made sure that I never asked for money. It's you, you. So he put blame you. So Ramakrishna said, don't worry. From now on, you'll have enough money to survive. Your family will have enough money. Don't worry. But this is a real story. So when you hear real stories, look, I am a rationalist. I prefer to think of ultimate reality as a principle underpinning reality. All these gods, goddesses don't attract me. But when I hear this story about Vivekananda's hair standing on end and seeing, I say, yeah, this is real stuff. So God with form and without form are both valid. Please remember that. Fabulous. So we have a really interesting topic to discuss today. So before we get started, let me just do a quick synopsis of what the topic is that we're talking about. So we have uh, the topic of Murti Puja, or in the Western world is sometimes referred to as idol worship. Uh, and so idol, uh, idolatry basically refers to worship of a tangible um, idol, such as a statue or an icon. And in the Abrahamic side of things, it denotes the worship of something other than God. So it's known as a false God to be exact. But in Hinduism, uh, things are... Uh, these um, icons or statues are actually worshipped as reminders of gods. So, for example, every year in Mumbai, we have a very big festival where many, many Hindus come together and bring clay images of Lord Ganesha to their homes. And they worship him for a day or two before immersing that image into the sea. So the ritual includes the veneration or what we call aradhana, which involves welcoming, welcoming the divine giving them a bath, offering them food, clothes, perfumes, lamp, incense, and finally words of praise. And here the idol is seen as the vehicle, a physical, tangible carrier of God. But there is so many, many things to discuss on this topic, and it's such an interesting one. I'm going to hand over to Manish Pai to get us started. We have full house today with Sita Ben and uh, uh, Vijay Bhai as well. So. Manish Pai, over to you. Welcome to today's broadcast. And I will pop in with some questions of my own uh, in between. Thank you, Nishad Bhai. A wonderful topic, a uh, very interesting one. And something that uh, Hindus get challenged uh, many times. Uh, and uh, it sometimes uh, creates doubts in our minds as well, is uh, due to some events that happen that... Uh, uh, like in the life of um, Dayanand Saraswati, um, for example. So it's it's a topic that uh, is very relevant because it's very popular and it is always challenged by non-Hindus. What is your take on, uh, but you know, when uh, Murti uh, or image of uh, God is uh, put in a temple, they do something called prana pratista, where uh, they do a ceremony ritual. Uh, thereby, uh, they after that uh, ritual, they consider the god to be a living god, um, and they treat the image like that. Uh, what is your take on uh, this ceremony and the significance of it, um, Vijay Bhai? Oh yeah, I mean, I think the thing is that in Hinduism, you know, we accept. There's so many ways to see the divine. And one, of course, is the idea of Sagun Brahman or, you know, seeing God in a, in a kind of a form. So the quite a few temples, I mean, I know in, in my temple locally, there was a huge ceremony when the Murti was first, you know, uh, installed, right? So Pran Pratishta. So when they did the Murti Pratishta, they did a huge ceremony where the idea is that you infuse life into the, into the image <clears throat> as such. So you worship as a living God. But I think the main thing is to remember is that in a way it's just a, a representation of, of kind of, you know, a God. It's not, the stone has no power itself. It's the way you worship God. I mean, as we said a while back there, you know, God can be seen in anything, in plants, life, everywhere. So the idea of 
inspiring God is a is a means to focus on God. That's the key to remember is to focus on God. By doing the ceremony, it's just to get people aware that this image is special in the sense it will now be used communally to focus on the ultimate. So the ultimate can be sometimes put in a form because in a way our senses limit us. So that's one way of worshiping. And it's one of many ways. That's why Hinduism is really great. You can, depending on everybody's ability, aptitude, and the emotions, we can see God in many, uh, in a multitude of ways. Uh, Sita? Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, if you look at um, that ritual or if you look at any ritual, not just within Hinduism, but across any religion, when you analyze it, what is this ritual? Usually you can see that it's a cluster of symbolic gestures. That's why it's so incredibly important to really understand what you're doing. Otherwise, it just becomes mechanical and meaningless. So having this sort of all these symbolic gestures put together, it becomes a ritual. And it's really important for helping to focus our mind on the idea of there is here. We are putting God here in this mandir, in this temple. And we are sort of, you know, acknowledging that we are recognizing that. I mean, as Vijay Bhai said, we understand that there is, you know, God is in everything. Spirit is already in everything. But sometimes we need these rituals to help us reinforce that message into our system, basically help remember and remind ourselves that, look, here we are dedicating this particular image to this um, deity and here we're going to place it here. So I think it's really important to remember that. And, you know, as we've discussed, I mean, Hinduism comes under a lot of fire for saying, oh, you're worth worshipping stones and marbles and what kind of a religion is this? But actually, every in every aspect of our life, we need these sort of handles to help us get a better understanding of spirituality because spirituality can be so incredibly subtle and very difficult to get our minds around so actually having these images having symbols all of the world religions have symbols they all use these things to help us get a better handle on reality so I think it's important to acknowledge it it's important to celebrate it and not put it down because we have to recognize our human limitations um, you know, if you try and sit down and meditate on the idea of Brahman or spirit, it's very difficult to get your mind around. But if you've got an image of God, if you've got a symbol, if you've got a mantra, if you've got something to hang, hang your thoughts on, then it helps you much better focus your energies and your attention. So I think we shouldn't underestimate the importance of symbols and the words, uh, Sanskrit word pratik, uh, symbol, uh, something to help us go towards the idea of spirituality is incredibly important. That's wonderful to hear, Sita Ben. Um, you know, uh, we look at the historicity of uh, the image worship. Uh, we find, uh, I think, the image of Mother Goddess in the um, Indus Valley civilization has been found. And we see in Ramayana, Rama worshipping Sivalinga. Uh, so it's been there for a very long time. Um, and uh, some uh, Muslim uh, uh, speaker talks about Natatra Pratimasti, quoting Yajurveda, some uh, chapter verse, saying, oh, Hindus, uh, your Vedas say there's no image worship. And we see all this image worship happening from throughout the ages. So how do we answer to that, uh, uh, Sita Ben? I mean, yeah, I mean, just as we've been saying, I mean, if you take things out of context, it becomes very sort of distorted. So you have to make sure that you don't just pull out bits from here, bits from there and stick them together in a different context, because then it makes it sound completely contradictory and very different. And then if somebody who is new to Hinduism listens to this very sort of reconstructed view of Hinduism, it can give a very disjointed vision of Hinduism and you think what kind of a religion is this? So it's really important to understand everything in a structured way, understand the context in which these words have been said and written. Um, so yes, I mean, in some contexts, uh, for some individuals, this idea of um, God without form doesn't appeal. And that's totally fine. That's part and parcel of Hinduism is we recognize that you can think of God in such a variety of different ways. And if God with form doesn't appeal to you, then go for it, go for the idea of spirit, go for the idea of Brahman and Atman. But also we have to recognize that for the vast majority of human beings, we need some kind of tangible handle 
to help us understand spirituality. And that's the purpose of having Sagun Sakar, God with form and with quality. Because when we sort of look around us, what human beings do is we form relationships. That's what we are experts at. We form relationships with our family, our friends, and we are familiar with that. So why not sort of extrapolate that idea of building a relationship with the people around you to the idea of building relationship like that with God, because that's something we know how to do. So why not think of God as a person and think of God as your mother, your father, even your child. You can think of God as your friend, as your sweetheart. We've got so many beautiful relationships that you can think of God as. <clears throat> and if that's the way that appeals to you, then absolutely go for it. And I think the more ways that we have to think about spirituality, it's something that should be celebrated and not something to be a cause for friction because pluralism and plural, plural, plurality is something that's so integral to Hinduism. I mean, that's one of the definitions of being a Hindu is you understand that there are lots of different ways of making spiritual progress. So the more ways there are, the better, and they should all sit together in harmony. Uh, Vijay Pai? I think um, you've got really valid points, Sita. I think the main thing is Manishwa here is that uh, as people just, as Sita said, people quote out of context. I think the problem is that many scholars, especially who are kind of uh, from kind of Abrahamic face kind of religion of the book, they sometimes use, you know, other books and look, your book says that. And when you ask them, do you accept that our book is divinely revealed? They go, oh, no, we don't accept that. But this phase will take out so we can buttress our own point. And that's not how Hinduism works, as Sita mentioned, because the thing is, either you accept that our scriptures are divine revealed, which they won't accept, right? But it's all oh, your scripture says, look, it's true. It doesn't work like that. The key thing is, I think we have to accept that there are many different ways. It is true that in the Upanishads, mainly it talks about Advait, that even the scholars who are Advait in nature, like, you know, Ramana, they accept that. The Advait comes a lot of Upanishads, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we are book followers. We don't copy, you know, books like zombies. We think for ourselves. Yes, in particular context, it makes a lot of sense. In other contexts, like as Sita says, when you talk about normal human life, where you have emotions, and one of the best ways to keep sane is to have relationships with God. Or it makes you, you know, much more in a, a emotionally sound person, makes you feel better emotionally. Then why not? And some people can mix the two together. At some point, they feel, no, I want to think of God as, you know, universal spirit. So, you know, you know, I feel like I want to see God in a beautiful image. And so be it. There's nothing wrong. I think we have to accept that God is not something uh, very narrow. God is immense and vast. The idea of divine is so vast. And there's so many ways to approach it. And this is something beautiful about, um, it's not only, by the way, only of God, even simple things like, you know, atoms can be seen as a wave, an atom, depending on some cases, when you're doing some sort of work, you have to think of an atom, it makes sense. In some cases, like if it's quantum mechanics, it makes sense as a, you know, a wave, right? But they're both right. The same thing can be approached so many different ways. And it's no different, go, I mean, God is even more vast than an atom. It's far infinite. Why should you only have one door to get to him? There should be multiple ways. That's the only way it makes sense. Yeah. It's a wonderful answer, Anisiba, uh, Vijay Bhai, Sita Ben. Uh, one question is, um, uh, we, we saw the example of Swami Vekan and, and uh, Ramakrishna Paramahansa. Is there any other saints and uh, sages whose experienced God using the images, Vijay Bhai? I think a lot of them, have, I mean, a lot of uh, uh, sages, actually all the great, you know, um, bards of India, like Mirabai, uh, Purandar Das, Tukkaram, they've all experienced God in image. I mean, Mirabai, we know that uh, it is said that even when she left this abode, she actually merged into a murti. That's the story, you know, which is said to be very common. So for her, Krishna was, when she saw image, she didn't see just Krishna in an image. She's a real Krishna, Krishna as, you know, divine being. And same with all the great, you know, the bhaktas of India, you know, the great, great, you know, very famous bhaktas. So it's been quite common in any tradition where God is seen in an image. But the thing is, is it's not the question of, of the image actually, you know, become, it's, it's to see beyond that image, see the God actually, you know, manifest in front of you. That is important. I, I mean, the way I see it for Ram, Krishna, Paramahansa, or uh, even Swami Vivekananda, it could be any temple, any image. They're so intensely devout, they can actually make God alive from that murti. And that's the power of, you know, Hinduism. You can bring a stone alive. I mean, what, what can you say, right? 
that's the beauty it's not a, it's not a thing that you know take it easily that's the beauty of our human works it is quite interesting i was reading this um uh, works on you know chanakya at one time and he was saying it's it's only in india that a man can become a god or we can make anything into a god and that is a beautiful thing i think we should celebrate that kind of idea so anyway chita <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we're, we're very lucky. I mean, in the Indian subcontinent, we've had so many saints who have seen God, at, uh, you know, uh, God as Krishna, God as Ram, so many deities, and it sort of brings it to life. So I think it's a really beautiful thing to celebrate. But one thing that's always, you know, sounds like a bit of a contradiction in terms is, you know, you have this idea of Atman and Brahman and being this, you know, vast sort of immense concept and then thinking of god with form they sound like completely different things and you think how can they just sit together like this but actually when you think about it the conclusion of you know all of these different pathways to god is all about sort of robbing away the idea of you know who you think you are and realizing who you actually are so when you are sort of reach the conclusion of bhakti the conclusion of devotion to a particular form of god the conclusion is that you are no longer able to see yourself as separate from the object of your love which is god you but you realize that you are god you know you start off by thinking oh god you look so beautiful you've got dad always says oh god you've got lovely eyes you've got lovely lotus eyes and you know how long can you just sit there looking at the lotus eyes <laughs> when you actually the conclusion of bhakti the, the truest form of love the truest form of devotion is where you can no longer see yourself apart from god and you see yourself as god and i think the beautiful image of hanuman where he opens his chest and he sees you know there's an image of ram inside really shows the sort of you know how the two different pathways sort of coalesce and they actually end up in the same same destination fabulous i mean this is a topic that we could go on and on for a very long time so what i'm going to do is i'm going to try and attempt to sort of answer some of the questions that the viewers may have or certainly at least i do have some questions around this so i'm going to do a rapid fire style q and a session with uh, our three experts here i'm going to start with sita ben so before we get into the topic of murti puja let's understand the difference between the concepts of god with form and god without form in hinduism yes uh, so the concept of god without form is called nirgun nirakar god without form without quality and broadly speaking it's god appearing as the universe and god appearing as all living things so that's the very sort of vast concept uh, which is called advait which is where you see yourself as part of this sort of Yeah, immense sort of creation and the other part is this idea of uh, sagun sakar which is god with form and with quality where you see god as a person and you build a relationship of love with that person but as as we just discussed they sound like two completely different things but ultimately they do unite and become the same thing super so that's how the vedas started very early on worshiping nature and uh, and other things and then as we moved forward we then had personality based um things as well so vijay bhai the next question for you is how do different denominations of hinduism view the concept of god with form so i think all does everybody, does everybody <clears throat> agree to this yeah i mean i agree i mean every denomination if you ask them they will say our form, favorite form of god is the one that we worship but they never deny the others they said look it's good for them but what is best for us and that's told vijay bhai repeats many times my mum is best for me right and say my dear so if he, if i go to my temple swaminarayan temple everybody says that for us swaminarayan is the supreme deity and that's the best way we see him as god that's fine if you go to iskon that's no krishna is a form of deity and that's the best form but that's fine too i think the idea is that different denominations will have different ways of seeing or perceiving bhakti but the good thing about hindus they will never deny the others are, are kind of false they say look as for them that is the best part for them this is the best part So it's okay to make you know it's okay even to say that my dinner is best but only for me that's the key thing to keep in mind because you can't say it's best for everybody then you fall in the trap of the abrahamic exclusive faith so we we never say that but we do accept that what is best for me not as the best for others like a river that flows to the sea you have little little areas that it will pick its own path and but it'll merge to the sea at the same no 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 different from any other one correct yeah wonderful so manish bhai the next question for you then is what is the significance of murti puja in the in relation to the concept of god with form 
in in Hinduism, what's the what's the importance of or significance of Murti Puja? I think significance of Murti Murti Puja is uh, because you got an image that you can relate to, and it becomes your own personal place where uh, you could do you know do regular uh, particular type, and you could have a discipline effort into come com- connecting with the God. And that is the very significance because it's uh, you, not just uh, you do it once and uh, you would have that relation. It's uh, over the time you develop that love. So uh, an image at home or a particular temple, you go regularly, you develop this tremendous uh, attraction bond with that image. And that image uh, help you lead with the to the idea of God. And th- that is the significance, I, I feel. Fabulous. Um, so, Tita Ben, I'd like to ask you the next question, which is, can you explain the relationship between God with form and the idea of devotion and bhakti in Hinduism? Uh, yes. So, um, God with form is obviously God as a person. So, you can think of God. We've got so many different deities that you can choose from in Hinduism. So, you choose the one that appeals to you. And you build a relationship of love with that particular deity. And, um, you know, some people, they, you know, they like to think of God even as their child, as their friend, as their confidant, as their mother or their father. And we are so used to building these very human, very personal relationships with those around us. So, why not? extrapolate that and make it into a relationship with with God essentially Um, because we're used to this you know that's what what human life is all about is creating these relationships so why not use what we're good at to help us on our spiritual journey superb so Vijay Bhai the next question for you is is Murti Puja considered idol worship in Hinduism absolutely not I think one thing to keep very clear is that and I, I take this this had only with many interfaith dialogues that go go with. You see, in the olden days, there was a belief that the stone or some have power. You know, like if you notice, some people wear a ring. They say this ring has got special powers, or if I if I have this thing in this particular object home, it got special powers. The object has no special power, and that is idol worship. We do not worship idols. We worship the divine in a finite form, so it helps us focus because our senses limit us, right? If emotions, what Asita mentioned, relationships are very what we're really good at. So what we say is an image of God is actually used to how do how they get the infinite and lock him into a finite form so I can focus on it. That's the key idea with uh, uh, Murti Puja. We don't believe the stone has powers. This is what used to happen in the olden days. This oh, a special stone comes, oh, this stone has power. It gives me some special current. We don't believe that. We believe that actually image is, as you know, Sita mentioned, the word is Prati. Prati means going towards. And the word prati can be in two forms, pratima and pratik. So pratima is image of God, and pratik is symbols of God. And to be honest, even religions which say we don't believe in idols, they do use objects. They cannot deny that. The cross or you know the, the Torah, they all use objects to focus. It helps us. They don't believe that the cross, whatever is God itself, but they use them to focus. And we are a bit more honest about it. We don't hide behind, you know, some words. We say, yes, we do. And we're not apologetic at all. So using an image to get the finite, infinite into finite form so they focus on it, we, we are happy with it and we accept that that's, that's, that's one way of making progress. So no, we don't worship stones for the sake of it. Yeah, We have to keep that in mind. Fabulous. So Manish Bhai, I've got a question for you. How does the use of icons and images in Hinduism compare to their use in other mainstream religions? I mean, I don't think I can recall any religion that doesn't use some form of iconography or uh, some sort of a symbol. Uh, That that is true. Um, You you go to Christian churches and there are wonderful mosaics of uh, Christ and images of uh, life of Christ. Uh, Similarly, uh, Buddhism, you know, uh, uh, murtis of Buddha everywhere. Um, and so on. Uh, Islam tend to not use too much images, but uh, if you go to is someone, a follower of Islam, their house, they would have an um, uh, image of uh, Kaaba uh, or some, something, something like that imagery. So they are still even uh, aspiring to highest using those images. 
so it is everywhere because you know as a human we have we think in terms of what we see what our mind perceives and what we speak about so we are limited in that sense and the way we relate to god is limited and we use all these images and speech and words to try to relate to that idea of uh, uh, the divine and that is all fine fabulous so yeah somebody just mentioned on the on the chat you know they they, they see whenever ganesh puja is done the ganesh is decorated with various different little fancy outfits and it's like you know every person has their own view of how they want to see their ganesh and so they will decorate or dress up their ganesh the way uh, in their idea of how they would like to see their ganesh so pick your path is such an amazing thing uh, for us in hinduism and allows us so much more vastness to have inclusivity and diversity and the way people can approach um, their own pathway to spiritual uh, progress so let's move on to the next question which is uh, sita ben uh, how do the hindu scriptural texts such as the vedas and the upanishads address the use of icons and images in worship uh yes yeah, so, i mean if you look at the upanishads and things like that actually they you know there is no concept of god with form in a lot of these um upanishads and the you know the last part of the the vedas the vedant um it focuses more on the idea of advait and actually a lot of people may be surprised because when you think of hinduism you think of all these 330 million deities and you think oh that's what it's all about but surprisingly enough hinduism didn't start like that it started off with this very principle based vision of um seeing the divine in everything and everyone around us that's how it started and i think because it kind of it molds depending on the the human mindset of a particular time they found that you know actually this idea of god with form is actually very attractive and very appealing so god actually came after a lot of these um you know beautiful subtle ideas were presented then just to make it more sort of appealing and attractive to the wider population we have this idea of gods and goddesses so that came after god came after <laughs> the fact okay wonderful vijay bhai so we've discussed murti puja what it is the difference between god with form without form and then various different things uh, around it now the question to you is how has murti puja been perceived by non hindu audience and what can they learn from it i think the thing is the history the history of the non kind of hindu faith has is different from the indic traditions so in many ways they have grown up uh, as they call it idol worship which is you know worshiping uh, stones or objects or whatever and the idol the object has got some sort of special power i think they need to understand that hindus do not see the stone itself as having any powers it is seen as an image that helps us focus on the infinite because our senses limit us that's the key to remember i mean also i'll give you an example when um, i was actually in kutch when the earthquake happened in 2001 and so many temples images are destroyed nobody even oh my faith is now dead because the image is destroyed nobody said that they took the images they they did a little ceremony they, they put them in the in the in the river or something and they built they were sculptors from rajasthan they built beautiful new ones and they installed them in the ceremony rituals and installed, now they worship those new ones and that's it there was no idea that god is now gone because image is gone. so the god doesn't create an image but we have to accept that generally it's for many people vast many people it's very hard to focus on an abstract idea of the divine so if you lock it in into a into a form doesn't matter if it's a pratik or a pratima both of them it helps you focus and that's the key thing to keep in mind yeah Superb. So I am going to ask one more last question to Manish Pai. Then I'll summarize the topic. Manish Pai, in the meanwhile, please pick up questions that are on the on the chat. And then we'll end with that topic and we'll move on to other questions. So um, we've talked a lot about murti worship, but uh, or, or murti puja. But how does the idea of aradhana or worshiping relate to the idol worship in Hinduism? What's actually done? What are some of the things people do when we say murti puja? Sorry, could you repeat it? Uh, what is meant by murti puja? What are some of the things when we do puja with a murti? Mm -hmm. And I will summarize it as well. But what are some of the things we do when we do murti puja? Yes, yeah, so murti puja. You you got the image of a god, and uh, uh, 
you know, the regular thing, uh, uh, our uh, ritual ceremony would be to offer uh, flowers, uh, do tilak to the murti. So you could relate to that image just like a real person or a real god there. And uh, you could offer him sweet and uh, eat that as a prasadam. So in that sense, you, you are actually treating the image as a live uh, being there, uh, and you're building relationship. And especially in a hard times, uh, when you are in hard time, this kind of uh, thing can really hold, hold hands to with you, you know? Uh, when you are in trouble and you, you know, very tearfully or with full heart full of devotion, when you invoke that, uh, you know, deity, they do help. When, uh, you know, and uh, it is said in our uh, uh, tradition that what is God, the uh, deity or God looking for is a heart full of love. And as long as you are able to develop that love, that, uh, you know, person, that will help you. And uh, it does happen. And, uh, you know, there are many stories of this kind that uh, people have got uh, some kind of miraculous uh, happening because of uh, this kind of uh, worship. So it is wonderful. Amazing. So folks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to summarize this uh, interesting topic that we've had uh, in my own way. So Murti Puja is basically a Hindu religious practice in which a Murti or a sacred image of a of a deity or a divine personality is worshipped. So the murti can be made of various materials. It could be including stone, metal, wood, or clay, uh, and can depict a number of Hindu deities, including Vishnu, Shiva, Durga, and many, many, many others. Right? So the murti is usually placed in a temple or in a home altar, and puja or worship is performed in front of it. And so the puja is typically um, involving offering of flowers, fruits and incense, as well as reciting mantras and singing of devotional songs. So it is believed that by performing this puja, the devotees can establish a connection with the divine or the deity and gain blessings and protection. So the Murti Puja is considered a form of idol worship in Hinduism, but it is different from idol worship in other religions. Hinduism teaches us that the physical form of God is not the ultimate reality but a means of worship, devotion, and connection to the divine. So the use of icons and images in Hinduism is also different from other main, major religions. And it may seem that uh, it may seem as a symbol and representation of the divine rather than the ultimate reality. So I, I hope that summarizes the topic. Have I missed out anything? Please, um, Manish, by over to you now. Thank you, Nisid Bhai. Um, you know, Buddhist temples, they do have many images of uh, Hindu gods and goddesses. So there you go. They, they have a goddess of knowledge because the, it was transported from uh, India to all these different places. So you can see those images in the Buddhist temples as well. Uh, we take a question from Alan Doji, Don Saji, who's asking many questions and many interesting questions. So his first question was, is Siva both good and evil? Agora, Siva, etc. How can we tell God is all good? So if it's Siva, we see this idea of um, Kal Bhairav, a really fierce form of Siva or Rudra, who is really fierce and goes and uh, especially he destroys the um, Yagna of ducks. That is the one of the main, I uh, think, story uh, in Siva. So what's going on here? Is Siva evil as well as uh, God? What was happening there, uh, Vijay Bhai? I think one thing to keep in mind, this, this is very interesting because, you know, usually people think that God, this universe has created, God is all good, he doesn't do, but look, then who, who is bad? If, if, if you say uh, Satan is bad, that means God didn't create Satan. God has to create everything, right? It's also the whole, as, as Jay Bhai said, the, the way cookie crumbles, the divine spirit comes out of everything. You can't just say, okay, only half the good is me. The rest is not to do with God. Does it mean God didn't create the bad? <laughs> you can't say that. So this Shiva is very special because Shiva is all encompassing. Everything in the universe, good, bad, night, everything is encompassing Shiva. So the whole universe can be seen as Shiva. So sometimes people depict the negative aspects as a form of God, this fierceness, 
the God. Well, I think we have to be very careful because the idea is very important that we do not just see the only half of the universe is, is linked to God. Everything linked to God, good, bad, ugly, beautiful, has to be all encompassing. And in that sense, you know, Shiva, I like Shiva because that's why Shiva is good because he doesn't, the idea, she doesn't shy away from his idea that the whole universe and everything in the universe is part of Shiva. And sometimes he actually kind of personalized those aspects of Shiva. <laughs> like, you know, you know, as you know, Shiva has got so many names. Pashupati Nath, Lord of all the animals, yeah? Bole Nath, or simpleton. Is simpleton a bad thing? Not necessarily, because it's all part of creation, right? Or God can be seen as, you know, I think also Aushad Nath with medicine, everything. I mean, some people see him in all kinds of aspects. So obviously all these aspects and Agori Shiva is but one of the aspects. But I mean, personally, I've seen these Agori Bhavas and they're really scary. I don't really want to associate with them. But look, in Hinduism, there are going to be all these facets. You can't just say, I don't like you, so I should wipe them off. We don't do that, right? Let people do whatever point they are, maybe strange, weird, bizarre. Let them continue, right? Otherwise, you know what will happen is we will try and start getting, become a, a faith which says, take everything out, only my way is the highway. And we don't want to do that, right? Then you're not really walking in the path of God in that sense. So yes, I think this idea of Shiva is both. God is everything, right? So keep that in mind, yeah? Uh, Sita? Yeah, I think the really important thing to remember is that we create God in our image. Um, so the way that we want to create God, God will sort of come in that form. And I think what Vijay Bhai said is so true. You know, you can't sort of draw a demarcation of good and good and bad. The universe is what it is. The world is what it is. And I think it requires a certain level of maturity to say, you can't say that this is a very good action, um, purely good action, and this is a purely bad action, and this person is purely good, and this person is purely bad. That's just the way that humanity tries to make sense of the world. We have to understand that the universe is not black and white like that. God is not black and white like that. It's a million and one different shades of gray. And I think it requires a great level of maturity to recognize this is the way the cookie crumples. This is the way the world is. This is how we perceive this idea of the ultimate reality. So we have to make sure we understand that the world is everything and anything. Some people say, oh, the world is, oh, it's great. It's good. Some people say the world is terrible. What an awful place it is. But what you have to understand, it is anything and everything. It is exactly what we've made it. Um, and same with the idea of concept of God. We make God in our image. So if you want God to be fierce, he will be fierce for you. If you want God to be lovely and flowery, God will be lovely and flowery for you. So we create the image of God. And I think the other very um, important thing to recognize is that we kind of extrapolate what we think is great and grand onto the idea of God. So, you know, we like the idea of being loving. So we say God is all loving. We like the idea of power. So we say God is all powerful. So the, the only other thing that comes with that is, you know, when we extrapolate these like superlatives onto God, and then you say, oh, well, God is all loving and all compassionate and all powerful, then why is the world so full of tremendous suffering? So it comes with a lot of philosophical baggage when you try and extrapolate these qualities onto God, because then a lot of philosophical questions are not able to be answered. So you have to be mature and recognize we created God like this, so it's our problem to solve now. And we have to recognize the world is anything and everything. It's a million and one different shades of grey. That's very well put, Sita Ben Vijay Bhai. Um, also, we have, you know, Mother Goddess Kali and uh, uh, with image worship, uh, worship and Pratima worship, one thing we see is the uh, idea of sacrifice, where uh, in uh, some places they still do sacrifice of a goat or a uh, chicken and offer it to God. So what's going on? Is uh, Kali, uh, Goddess Kali is in similar vein uh, or not? Uh, uh, looking like evil with uh, wearing the garlands uh, of the skulls. Uh, Mother God is getting angry and uh, start annihilating the whole humankind. Uh, what's going on there, Sidami? Uh, yeah, so again, we have to say this is not bad. We're not saying that there is anything bad. This is how the cookie crumbles. And the word Kali comes from the Sanskrit Kala, which means time. And what it recognizes is that time is the all destroyer. And the mother goddess Kali is a personification of the fact that 
you know, everything in the physical universe is moving towards destruction. Everything in the physical universe is subject to change. And anything that is subject to change is subject to destruction. So the mother goddess Kali is not evil. She's just saying, look, I am a blatant, blunt reminder to you all. Look, everything is limited on this earth. Everything in the physical world is going to head towards destruction. So in a way, looking at this very fierce image kind of puts things into perspective for us because we're like our physical body our time here on earth is limited so make sure that you know here here's a very fierce image to remind you that you know make the most of your opportunity you've got on earth to make spiritual progress to realize what's important and what's not so important that's why you know she's got a necklace of skulls and her tongue is sticking out and she's holding a decapitated head. And, you know, a lot of people look at this image and they say, oh, what kind of an image is this? Like, what, what is Hinduism all about? But it's just a reminder to us that our time on Earth is limited. Um, everything in the physical world is heading towards destruction. But the important thing is we are not the physical body. We are the spirit, which is timeless and is not subject to all these rules of change. Um, Vijay Pai? No, I think absolutely agree, Sita. I think just to add on, Manish, by the other point you mentioned about sacrificing of animals, I think the thing is, I mean, I shudder, to be honest, but look, we have to accept that there are very many communities in the world which, from their own point of view, they see things differently. And they feel it by, by giving a sacrifice of, of, of life, that it makes them closer. Of course, I wouldn't do it, but again, we have to accept that everybody from their own point of, starting point of view, from whatever community they come from, a tribal community, which they live on this idea of maybe living in an area where it doesn't grow water, a lot of food or whatever. And they do that. In Nepal, they do that, I know, quite a bit. But even in Nepal, I realized, I heard that a lot of temples have stopped sacrificing, which is a good thing. People are moving towards, away from sacrifice. But I think the key thing is, because we're not in that, we haven't grown up in that community and we have never been as part of that, we can, we can never understand why they would like to do that as a, as a side of affection. But let them progress from where they are. That's all I would say. We shouldn't try and say, right, I'm going to get rid of all of you because they're doing X, Y, Z. I don't like it. It doesn't work like this. We have to be careful how we see things here. Yeah? I think generally, all temples are getting better and it's coming really down. Sacrifice is going down and hopefully in the future it will go away. That's, I, that's what I think. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, we got a question from Charmaine. Is she, is she saying, is worshipping a murti different from worshipping a photograph of God? Vijay uh, uh, No, I mean, you can have, I mean, nowadays a lot of people have photographs at home, which is fine as well. It, whatever suits you. I think in the temples, mainly they have images because it looks more real. And I think when you have, when you watch it in communal fashion, then you feel much more, uh, much more spiritual. Everybody kind of, everybody's energy gets together. But it's fine. I think most people keep um, uh, photographs. Some people even draw beautiful art in images. So I, mean, I think that whatever suits, whatever suits you best is fine. But I know some people have an image and they shower it every day, they put ghee or Shiva. Then you might want to not have a picture because it might get soggy, but then you might want something more solid. But it depends on you. So I don't think it, it matters, uh, Sita. Yeah, I, I completely agree. There's not much more to add. I mean, a picture is also going to help to focus your mind on the idea of spirit. So yes, there's nothing wrong with the picture as well. Thank you, Sita Ben Vijay Bhai. Uh, we take next question. Uh, SK is saying the problem with Murti Puja is when God starts responding to you, you share it with people and they take you to psychiatrists. Uh, and, uh, you know, even uh, Ram Krishna Paramhans was considered a mental case and they, they said, oh, we need to fix this guy. Um, so let's say you worship uh, this image and somehow you are getting this wonderful you know response or you're really the image is really responding to you. what how do you deal with that situation Sidavin? um yeah i mean just going from what ramakrishna says he's always says that whenever you have a spiritual experience keep it very sort of personal and keep it to yourself because it's a very private personal experience um i mean it's it's one of those things because it's not like a empirical evidence that you've pr produced. It's something that you have experienced and it's a very personal journey. So if you try and explain it to skeptics, they'll say, oh, this is garbage. This is, you know, yeah, yes, you need to go and see a psychiatrist. There's no truth to it. 
But the, the important thing is, you know, if you have had that experience, you know, and there is no stopping you. So I hope that, you know, you can use it as a way to build your confidence that you are going on the right path. Keep it a private journey. Don't tell the whole world about it because it will knock your confidence. If you have had that experience, you will know it and just progress from where you are. And hopefully you'll become enlightened one day. <laughs> um, is right? Uh, it's quite funny. I wish I wish I had that experience. You know, no, forget others. You know, when they say I did. I mean, the thing is, is if I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, for myself as well. Even I read some of the works of Ramakrishna Paramahansa, it means it sounds really strange and bizarre. So actually, I swapped and reading Vivekananda first, and now I now really understand what Ramakrishna Paramahansa all about. Because the thing is, this when somebody is intensely spiritual, to manifest God in front of you. I think it's, it's an amazing, I wish I, I wish I could do that. I can't, but if I could do that, I would love to do that. I mean, I don't really care what people see me as, right? <laughs> they can say whatever they want. As Sita said, it's something very personal, very intense. But the beauty thing is this, that look, if you look at the lives of Mirabai, you know, if you look at lives of, again, I mentioned Narsi Mehta, Tyaga Raja, there's some great, great, you know, doctors, you know, who have done, who tremendously got all the time in front of them. I mean, look at their lives. You don't say, oh, look, that person has got mental things. You say, wow, look at this person. Look at his life. Look at the intense spiritual falling out of him. I want to be like him. You don't say, okay, now, no, let me take you so I get to. But the, the, the day you understand the, why these people are so intense spiritual, then your mind frame, you set or your kind of frame of mind will change. You say, no, I want to be like him. But it takes a while for people because we live in a very material world and we always see people who are different from us say, oh, that person is not normal or something. But when you understand that, then you would like to be Ramakrishna Paramahansa, then you would like to be Mirabai. But we have reached that stage, we haven't reached that stage. That's the key thing here. Wonderful. Thank you, Vijay Bhai Sitabin. We take a next question from Abhinav Anand. He's saying, you know, uh, as even Ramakrishna Paramahansa said that in Kali Yuga, chant the name of uh, God and uh, Bhakti Yoga is the way. And uh, Abhinav saying, uh, I've read all this, but uh, I like more Raj Yoga and the part of meditation. Um, is it true that Bhakti Yoga is the fastest part or should I be doing Raj Yoga, uh, Vijay Bhai? It I depends on, again, you, what you, what, I mean, if, what, whatever suits you best. But I think the reason why we say Bhakti Yoga is because we live in a very materialistic world now. I mean, no, it didn't start now. It started like 200, 300 years ago. When people started owning Far more, far more than they have. You know, I have a special cloth. I have a silk cloth, you know, from China. I have, in those days, whatever, I have some beautiful shoes. I have so much money I can buy, you know, this beautiful cart or beautiful oxen. So materialism was already, already kicking in. So how do you get people off? And I tell you why Bhakti is very good. Because when you chant the name of God, you forget your material attraction. You know, you forget your, your material object. It really has you in the money chanting the name of God. For that moment, you forget, you know, I, I am a really wealthy man. So in that sense, very easy in a, in a kind of a very materialistic world. One way of you know, getting to a, in helping in moksha is getting chanting name of God because it blocks your mind or everything else. But if you are one of those persons who already knows your state of mind and if you look, no, I won't look inwards. I don't really care anyway about, most people do care about objects, let's face it. I love my, you know, Sony phone. I love my car. But if you're in that state, it's, look, it doesn't really matter. And you drive you're looking inward. That's fine too. But I think is the idea is that for vast majority of people, uh, bhakti mark bhakti mark is perhaps an easier way to start because the chanting can just make you uh, disciplined and focused. Right? Sita, I completely agree. I mean, for the vast majority of people, this idea of just having something much easier to focus on is something which can help you on your spiritual journey. But again, I mean, we have to remember that. You know, Ram Krishna was saying that to the to the general population. But if for you the idea of God with form doesn't appeal, that doesn't make it make it any. There's nothing wrong with that. If the idea of Raj Yoga is the one that appeals for you, then go for it. It's a very very difficult path for the vast majority of human beings. If you look at the sort of disciplines that you have to put on yourself for Raj Yoga, it's extremely difficult. But if that is the path that's attracting to you, then then please do go for it. But yes, the path of Bhakti Yoga is considered easier because you can build relationship with God in a very personalized and a very human way and you if you chant the name of God you've got something tangible in your everyday life that you can 
uh, used to focus on spirituality. But yeah, of course, the choice is yours, whichever path suits you the best. Uh, it's very well put. Uh, uh, I mean, now uh, Jai Bai has done uh, some uh, wonderful videos on Raj Yoga. You, you want to visit our YouTube channel and uh, type in Raj Yoga. He's done like, uh, we've done 10 videos on Raj Yoga. Might be helpful to you if you want to practice that uh, part of Raj Yoga. Uh, okay, uh, we take the next question. Uh, Kunal is asking, most of the people in India, they bring little Krishna, what they say, Laddu Gopal, but they never want to know about, about big Krishna who gave Bhagavad Gita. So does it lead to blind worship? Is this wrong, uh, you know, just focusing on little uh, baby uh, Krishna with uh, holding Laddu, uh, Sita Vin? Um, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because that's your the image of God that you love, that you are attracted to, that you are drawn to. And of course, he looks very sweet and very cute. And we all love the idea of babies. All of our faces light up when you see a baby who's, <laughs> whose face doesn't. So I think it's beautiful that we're able to translate that into the idea of God. You know, the idea of a baby is so pure and perfect and sweet. And if we can say that this is God, then what a beautiful thought. And if it helps you on your spiritual journey, just carrying that little image around with you, it can remind you on a day-to-day -day basis of, of God and of, of the idea of you know, Krishna. And it can really help you on your spiritual journey. So I don't see anything wrong with that. But of course, you know, please, if that doesn't appeal to you, there's nothing wrong with that as well. If you prefer to focus on growing up Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita, then of course that's your path. So I think the important thing is we respect all the different ways that you can think about God. God is the child, or if you want to focus on the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, it's all your choice. They are all leading to the same destination. Uh, Vijay Bhatt? Yeah, I mean, I've heard that as well. There are a lot of, uh, there are some groups in India, communities who actually worship baby Krishna. And they never talk about the big Krishna. And actually, I challenged once, you know, once I think in India, and I challenged somebody. And I said, oh, when Krishna grew up, then he was a human being, and human beings do all kinds of fight wars and whatever. So it's not that appealing to us. But Krishna as a baby is so, as I said, no faults, nothing, genuinely cute, whatever, is much more appealing. And that's fine too. I mean, if you think of, Krishna like that, then, then so be it. No, no problem. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> right. Uh, we take a last question for the day. Um, youth and Meditation is asked, uh, I would like to uh, know the idea of Kapalik part, which is sectarian, but is exploited uh, of the term and is not the right way as claimed by many. What's your take on it, uh, Vijay Bhai? Okay, Kapalik, from what I understand, I thought it's extinct, but it maybe still around. Kapalik is the idea, I think, that uh, some people worship Shiva with the idea of trident with the skull they have, and they go and begging in the skull as well. Look, in India, there's some very, very, I mean, they, they are supposed to be seen, I think, if I remember correctly, they're supposed to be seen as they go to people's house and they take people's problems away, and they put the gate on themselves. So they take people from people's mind and to themselves. But it's a very strange uh, kind of uh, very tantric tradition. That's why there are very, very few followers. It's not, it's not a usual thing to do. But in India, there have been very many, uh, what do you call, uh, tantric cults. Like the Thuggy cult, you know, which you know of, is very famous. Now it doesn't exist anyway. It's sacrificed, I think, many young boys or something. There were a lot of bizarre stuff in India. So Kapalik, I think, in a way, is, some people say that actually in ancient times, the very few special people who are actually in that path who can go around have that power take people's problems away. But the worship itself, the idea of using skulls and even take food in skulls is not wrong. That's a very strange way. So I think it will never, I think there'll be very, very few Indian, if they exist, I'm not sure, but it'll be very few, not that many. But you know who I am, who I want to question them, they can do that. But as I said, Hinduism is very diverse and very broad. And people have, some people will do strange things, but that's how things are, yeah, Sita? I completely agree. I mean, um, we're a spiritual democracy. Uh, we, we, people are allowed to practice spirituality in the way that suits them. I mean, I guess for the vast majority of people, like this kind of approach is probably not appealing, but we've got all kinds of people in the world and we have to recognize and sort of appreciate and acknowledge that they all try and reach the idea of spirituality in different ways. And hopefully we can all get to the same destination at the end of the day. Brilliant. I mean, where has the time gone? It's almost one hour into the broadcast. Well, almost, yes. So 
we're going to bring this to a close now. Um, I just want to say a, a heartfelt thank you to all our viewers for tuning into our weekly live stream broadcast and uh, focusing on today's topic of Murti Puja, what it is, how it fits into Hinduism. Is it idol worship or not? We had a great discussion around this. And if you want to catch up on it, please do look out for the replay of the live stream very shortly. We are thrilled to have such a dedicated and engaged audience who have participated in the discussion and shared their valuable insights with us. We'd like to remind you that you can continue to engage with us on our YouTube channel, Facebook, and Twitter as well. We encourage you to like, share, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel where we will be posting more videos on a regular basis. We would also appreciate it if you could share our broadcast with your friends and family so they too can benefit from the discussion and the insights that we have got. Uh, jo, a final reminder that we have our weekly live stream broadcast every Saturday at two o'clock UK time. And we would be delighted to have you back with us next week for more discussion and insight into different aspects of Hinduism in the modern world. So on behalf of the entire team of Hindu Academy, we would like to express our gratitude and um, say thank you for your support and participation. Thank you for being part of our community and helping us to spread the knowledge and understanding of Hinduism in the modern world. And before I close the broadcast for today, uh, please allow me to share one quote from Swami Vivekanand. And this one is, an interesting one. So apparently this quote goes that religion does not consist in erecting temples or building churches or attending public worship. It is not to be found in books or in words or in lectures or in organizations. Religion consists in realization. So like we said today, many ways to reach your same destination. So we wish you a great week ahead. I'll bring my team on board back again. And we'll wish you a wonderful week ahead and see you next week on Saturday at two o'clock. Bye-bye for now.